Woo. Good morning. Thanks for coming to CSIS. We've got a good event here and some good speakers uh, on digitalization in the industrial sector and the implications for energy and technology. Um, the format today is we'll have our two speakers. We'll then have a conversation with a few questions. Then we'll throw it open to you uh, for anything, questions or comments you might want to make. My name is Jim Lewis. I work here at CSIS. Um, let me introduce our speakers. Dr. Timothy Lewin is the uh, David S. Lewis, no relation, uh, professor and executive director of the Strategic Energy Institute at Georgia Tech. And he manages Georgia Tech's uh, overall strategy for the energy portfolio. Um, I love Georgia Tech. Uh, I wouldn't know if I'd go to Atlanta in the summer, but anyhow, great school. Um, he works on the DOE National Petroleum Council, the Board of Governors of Oak Ridge, and he has a long list of honors here that I'm not going to read because we don't have enough time. But um, we're very happy that you're here. We'll open with him. Sitting next to him is Barbara Humpton, who is the CEO of Siemens USA for one month. So congratulations. <laughs> um, uh, prior to that, she worked at uh, CEO of the Siemens of Siemens Government Technologies, which brought Siemens Technologies across the board to uh, the federal government. And now she's focused a bit more on the government and the private sector. Um, lots of experience, lives in Washington, so that's a plus. Uh, and we're looking forward to her. She'll follow uh, with a few remarks um, after Tim. So with that, why don't we go ahead and get started? Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Okay, well, thank you. It's a real privilege to be here at CSIS and um, really appreciate the uh, partnership we have with CSIS. Sarah Ladislaw serves on the, uh, actually on the advisory board of the Energy Institute I run, so really appreciate having CSIS's um, significant engagement as we kind of craft our overall strategy. And then obviously Siemens is a great partner for us at Georgia Tech, so really happy to be here. Um, before I, I just kind of initiate my opening remarks, I'll just quickly introduce sort of the overall energy portfolio that we have at Georgia Tech. So as, it mentioned, as Jim mentioned, I run our Energy Institute. So we have about 1,000 people at Georgia Tech working on pretty much the whole value chain of energy ranging from science to technology to policy, economics, and, and, and tech transfer. And so a big part of my job is just managing that strategy and serving as the, the system integrator for that. And uh, one of the things we did about two years ago was we stood up something called the Energy Policy and Innovation Center. And the idea was it was, it was basically to be a, a, a regional think tank and really with the idea that many energy issues of, 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 of global import and of national import at the end of the day are really resolved at the state and the regional level. And so to, to make progress on these issues, really you have to be tackling them at, at the regional level because you know whether you're talking about um, what the resource mix looks like, that's very intrinsically regional, or whether you're looking at the demographics of a region, the politics of a region, uh, the infrastructure, all of those are. And so what the, the best solution for not only for a region and a state, but also for the nation and, and, and the, the globe as a, as a whole, again, at the end of the day, is, is, is very, there, there's a lot of regional contextualization. And so the idea of the Energy Policy and Innovation Center was to really do that at, from, a, from a, a southeastern regional point of view. And as part of that, we identified essentially four kind of cross-cutting themes that, we're, that we'll be tackling. And uh, one of those is resilience, one of those is, is energy equity is issues, another is public education and outreach. And then the fourth one, which is why I'm here today, is on digitalization in, uh, in the energy sector and more generally in the, in the industrial sector. And so you might, you might ask, well, what's, what's the regional play on digitalization? This, this is very much a, a global global national trend, what's, what's the regional angle? And um, one, of the, one of the reasons we decided to highlight that as a, as a distinctive thread for, for, for looking at was just kind of an informal look at what was happening in the region. And so if I can just take exhibit A would be, um, let's just, if we take large industrial companies like General Electric and Siemens, uh, GE just outside of Atlanta has the world's largest facility that is bringing in data from 60 countries from over 5,000 power generation assets around the world. They're aggregating, they're analyzing, and they're, and they're developing products and services. Siemens, similar type facility in Orlando. Um, company called Next Era, located in Florida. It's the country's largest operator of wind turbines. Well, that wind turbine data flows into Florida, where again, it's analyzed. In fact, they, they, 
directions go the other direction. They actually control the, those facilities from there. And so what we realized was is that this ecosystem had been sort of spontaneously emerging in the region around aggregating, analyzing, monetizing data from industrial assets. And so we wanted to, to really take a look at that. And so one of the things we did, which is, which is highlighted in the announcement, was uh, Jennifer Clark, who's a faculty member at Georgia Tech, did a study just looking at the emerging industry, the emerging ecosystems around industrial data. And um, so what I wanted to do is just give a couple highlights just to kind of set the, set, set the tone here. And I thought it might be worthwhile just to, what I'm going to do is talk about first, why is industrial data interesting? We're, we're, we hear a lot about in, uh, data, we hear a lot about machine learning and high performance computing. What's interesting or new or, or unique about this particular sector that make it worthy of a uh, special conversation? So I'll talk about that. Then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the value propositions around uh, industrial data. Then I want to talk about some of the issues um, in the business models around uh, industrial data, which are very much actively going on both in the business sector and the policy sector. So let me, let me just start by first talking about why industrial data is interesting and, and worthy of a focused discussion. I just, and, and I'll get into this later, but, but point, bottom line, there's big money. You know, in, in the tens of billions of dollars um, by appropriately having access to data and, and realizing the value streams. And I'll, and I'll dig into that a little bit more later. Um, but uh, if I think about the, maybe, uh, let me just back up for a minute. And, and before I dig into industrial data specifically, let me just, a little bit of a rubric to, to think about types of data uh, sets that are out there. And this is certainly not meant to be complete or, or uh, to capture every potential idea of, of, of data sets. But if you think about, I'm, I'm going to just sort of differentiate between at least three kinds of data sets. And one would be sort of consumer type data or what I would think about as socially emergent data sets. So in other words, you think about consumer behavior, uh, you know, just uh, Facebook, you know, just as you get a lot of networked people interacting, you get these emergent trends that arise. They're not governed by any immutable law, but they arise and you can, by using suitable analytics, you can go in and, and, and detect them and then you can figure out how you might go about monetizing them or do something interesting with them. You know? And you can think about that going from the grand sweep of history and just the emergent behavior around the grand sweep of history to things like identifying flu outbreaks by the number of times people are searching for CVS on their Google Maps thing. You know, so you can think about that whole sweep. Um, another type of, so that's one data set. I would just sort of socially emergent data sets. Another type of data set would be things where you can simulate or train a, a, an analytic. And so, I, by the way, with, with all of this discussion, sort of data-driven approaches around machine learning and data analytics and, uh, and digital twins, I'm going I'm to come back to these. But, but the whole idea is how do you go from data to knowledge, to insight, to wisdom, to something you can act upon. And so, so as we're talking about this, I'm, I'm going to sort of go back and forth. But things that you can simulate and train. So for example, data sets, so, so very much interest today in autonomous vehicles, right? And so, well, how do you, how do you build these, these data-driven approaches that a car can drive autonomously? Uh, well, you could try to hard code all the rules in, but we realize that's impossible. So, so what are the approaches? Basically, cars are logging millions of miles driving with cameras and they're just logging the experience and they're training up, they're training up these, these machine learning approaches to be able to drive autonomously just by basically compiling a whole lot of experience that you can simulate. Another example would be, you, you may have seen um, how a, a computer uh, beat a human in this game of Go. Um, and, how did it do, and how did it do that? It basically, you, you program up the rules of Go and you play, the computer can play itself 10 billion times. It can learn every potential uh, manifestation of the game, and they can beat a human. And that's how, that's how they, they, they have been beating humans at chess in these games of Go. But the whole idea is, is that you can, you can generate these es essentially synthetic data sets for things that you can simulate. Um, and then lastly, I guess the last type of data set that I'd like to chat about is data sets which, which emerge from physical assets, so uh, which, which are subject to physical law. So here I'm thinking about power plants, I'm thinking about electrical grids, where there are laws of fused physics. They're immutable. You can dump as much venture capital as you want into something, but gravity is always going to point in a cer certain direction. And so these types of devices, you actually, what, what you're really trying to do then is figure out how do you merge data with underlying sort of domain expertise or physical, or, or underlying physics such that the two together give you the maximum value. So with that kind of a, is, is just a, a little bit of a sketch of a rubric, let me just chat about what differentiates industrial data 
from, from, other, from some of the other discussions. Um, and by the way, let me, I, I haven't defined industrial data, and, and, we don't, and, I don't think, and I don't, I'm not going to attempt to come up with a rigorous definition, but again, what I'm talking about are, is data that's coming from industrial-type facilities, power plants, jet engines, uh, physical infrastructure, um, logistical networks, th things like that. Um, so, so, the, um, so, so first of all, one of the big distinctives is generally privacy is, is less of an issue in this type of sector. You know, privacy is a huge issue on sort of the consumer data, but when you're talking about data from a power plant, it's, it's, it's really a non-issue. Um, also, in, in, these, in these industrial data sets, generally you're talking about data that is coming from assets which are physics-based devices. There are underlying physical laws. So as opposed to socially emergent type behavior where you might be able to figure out what's happening, but you ne don't, can't necessarily predict it, um, these, these other um, power plants, you, you, you basically know the equations that describe them. You can only go so far because they're too complicated to, to completely simulate them. But that's one of the, one of the real distinctives there. Um, training data set. So, so in, in, once, in some sense, you can somewhat train to, you know, you could maybe come up with what's a digital twin or something like that to somewhat simulate a power plant, uh, but you can only go so far. Um, and in particular, uh, as, as, as Siemens is, is intrinsically aware, you can't go to a customer and, and have them sort of run a power plant through all these kind of anomalous scenarios so that you could maybe detect a, a, a signature that might arise before a major anomalous fault, which would cause tens of millions of dollars, or a grid failure. You know, these are things you can't necessarily simulate. And so, um, which brings me to my next point, is that in many cases, these industrial data sets, what you're talking about, at least when you're thinking about reliability, is you're talking about trying to figure out how to capture low probability but very high consequence events, like a power plant failure, like a grid collapse, um, or, or anything in, in between. And you can't, you, you, you can't simulate that ahead of time. And so the, the, you really have to sort of bring the best of both worlds of modern data analytics and artificial intelligence with sort of underlying understanding of these devices. And how to do that is really where a lot of the secret sauce is in terms of the marketplace today, both from the, the big industrial OEMs as well as all the small businesses that, that are emerging. Um, so, uh, and, and I guess along that same line, so the other thing that, di because of that, the, the, the ecosystem that is emerging around industrial data looks different th than it is in sort of the consumer market. So what's happening, say, there's a lot of analytics firms around the country. The, the firms that are thinking about these kinds of applications oftentimes look different than those that are thinking about social media type applications. Um, but, but I, I, so those are some of the dif differentiators from some of the other conversations that are going on around data today. But there's also some commonalities. You know, the issue of data ownership which I hope we'll have time to get into today, you know, that's really the biggest issue. Ownership and access to data is, is really the ultimate realizer of the value. If you don't have the data, you can't realize the value from the data. And so there's, there's a lot of, of issues around there, both from a business model as well as a policy point of view. National sovereignty issues are, are, are common, you know, data flowing across corporate bound, uh, excuse me, national country boundaries and countries increasingly seeing their data sets as being national assets in the same way as I couldn't back up a truck into another country and take a, a physical asset, they wouldn't, they, they're becoming more cautious about exporting the data streams, which when aggregated are real sources of value. Um, and then cybersecurity, you know, that's, that's a huge issue across the board. It's a huge issue in, in this sector as well. Um, okay, so that's some of the, the distinctives. Let me talk a little bit about some of the value propositions now. And really, I guess if, if there's a couple different buckets where value comes, and I think and, and I'll just highlight two of those. One would be system efficiencies, just being able to realize better system efficiencies. Um, and by efficiencies, I mean that very broadly. It could be fuel costs. It could be just overall operational costs. The other one is, is reliability um, and, and having better operational and re reliable devices. So there's a, a white paper that's out there that was put out by uh, someone named Peter Evans when he was at General Electric. It's, it's called the Industrial Internet. It's a very influential white paper. And in that, he kind of frames this, this uh, this phrase, the power of the 1%. Um, and the idea is, is that by having access to these data sets, without, with a little bit of subject matter expertise, you can very easily increase the efficiency of large-scale systems by 1%. Now, 1% might sound like a small number, but remember, there's a big amplifier because, you know, if you, if you let's just say you get $100 for a service and it costs you 90, well, that's a $10 profit. Well, if you can drive down the cost to 89, that's an $11 profit, so a 1% reduction, an increase in efficiency is a 10% amplifier in, um, 
It's a 10x amplifier in, in, in profit. And so that 1% is a big deal. And so in that white paper, they came up with a couple numbers, and they pointed out that in the aviation sector, that's about a $2 billion a year market, that 1%. Um, uh, and the gas-fired power generation, which is the dominant source of electric power in the United States today, is, is, is natural gas-fired power generation, that's about $4 billion a year. Uh, in the rail network, that's $2 billion. Oil and gas, that's $6 billion. So those, just those sectors that were identified in that industrial internet white paper, that's a $14 billion a year market, 1%. Now, that's not to say you can't do better than that in some applications. Um, you know, in some cases, you can do 2 some cases, you can do 3%. But, but very quickly, you can take devices, and by customizing the, the unique local conditions and the unique operational profile, you can increase that, and that's, that's a tens of billions dollar global market. Um, the other one is, is component reliability. Um, so that's another significant value proposition. And, and so let me, I'll just use another example for gas-fired power plants, just because that's the largest source of power in the United States. So very high-tech pieces of equipment. You know, I'm, an, I'm a scientist and engineer, and these things are awesome. I mean, they're, they're Lamborghinis that make electric power, they're just, they're incredible, the things that they can do. But because of that, if there is a failure or a component problem, it can be really expensive. So, you know, some of the, the, the most expensive stuff in a modern gas turbine is what's called the hot section, where stuff is really hot. So a, a, a failure where a chunk of metal, let's say, liberates and goes downstream, that can, that can run into about $30 million um, per incident. Um, and so that, that's a lot of money. So if you aggregate that across the fleet, I, uh, I chatted in preparation for this, I called a friend of mine who works in the insurance business, and we did a, a quick back of the envelope estimate based upon their market share. And we estimated that the, the insurance market, what, when insurers pay out for these kinds of failures in the gas market globally, is about a billion dollars a year. Um, and so, and then, and, and so that's just from a, an individual owner operator issue. And the, but beyond that, there's the, the, um, the, the social benefits beyond just what, what you as a, a consumer or a business would get, there's the social benefits just beyond what the individual operators get just around system reliability and system resilience, particularly when we start talking about a national grid type, type level. Um, so those, just a quick summary, that's certainly not a complete s synthesis of all the value propositions, but that's just a quick summary of some of the propositions. I think the overall point that I want to get at here is we think about the, the movement of companies in this sector increasingly towards selling services, making, making money on services, rather than making money on the sale of the product itself. Um, uh, inst the data is a critical piece of, of ownership and access to, to the data that emerges from those devices in a service-related business model as opposed to a, uh, a hardware-type business model. Let me just, uh, so, so that's, that's the, the first two points I want to make. Why is industrial data interesting? A little bit about value propositions. Now I just want to flag a couple issues just worthy of, of further discussion. First one is ownership. And I, and I mentioned this before, but kind of the, an, an example I like to use is um, if I leave Atlanta on a Delta Airlines jet, um, which is, let's just say it's a Boeing aircraft, um, and it's powered by GE engines, and it flies from Atlanta to Beijing. Um, so what I have there is I have a, uh, an OEM of a jet engine, I have a system integrator, Boeing, I have an owner-operator, Delta, I have two countries, I potentially have some countries in between. So there's all that, the data, as I just pointed out to you, the data from that aircraft engine is really valuable. There's a lot, if you can have access to it, you can do a lot of really interesting things with it. Who owns that data? Um, you know, and so certainly there are some, that's, this is a, a realm which would be subject to, to, to commercial agreements, but there's certainly a lot of ambiguity around that issue, particularly with older assets. And, and so that's a really interesting issue which is being addressed today. Um, and also, I related to that, I, which I alluded to, is national sovereignty, as countries increasingly are viewing their assets as strategic assets. So if I go, I, I don't know what Siemens is doing, but, I, but if I can, I'll use an example from General Electric. And I mentioned the, uh, they have a very large facility, the largest facility, industrial data monitoring facility in the world, just outside of Atlanta. Well, what they've had to do is they've had to replicate that facility in Shanghai. They've had to replicate that facility in Dhamam, um, uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, because these countries are, are saying, yeah, we, you, we'll, we'll, we'll buy your assets and we'll buy your services, but the, the, the data stays in country. And so there's lots of interesting business model implications that, that come out of that as you start thinking about balkanization of, 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 of data sets. Um, <clears throat> so let me just talk, uh, last thing, I just want to chat about business models for a minute. Um, so what, what, what are, I talked about sort of the, the, the value propositions. And I would say, that I'd, I'd, if I were to look at, 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 the, at the business out there, I'd sort of see three kind of business models for, 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 an, for monetizing data. Um, first thing, it was probably the obvious one, is you do something of value with the data. So if you know a lot about power plants and you get access to the data, you can tell an operator how they can 
decrease fuel costs by a couple hundred million dollars over the next 10 years. That's really valuable because you know a lot about, the, about that asset. So you do something of value with the data, but you have to have it. Um, the other thing that you, that you would do is I, there's a lot of companies that, that are developing business models around just getting access to the data. Um, so sort of the classic example of this, which is a little bit tired now, but is Google's acquisition of Nest, right? You know, so the, the smart thermometer, so, excuse me, smart thermostat. And so you could, I wasn't in the boardroom when they talked about that acquisition, but I'm going to guess that they did not see thermostats as this 10x high, you know, super, super growth market. But my guess is what they did see is a great way to get access to a lot of homeowner energy data. And with access to that data, you could then do a lot of other things. You could contrive lots of other value-added services for everyone. And so the whole discussion that went on in the country a few years ago around smart meters and privacy and people pulling guns on utilities to get off their property because they can't install a smart meter, you know, that whole issue went away with the, the Nest because somebody's buying it and opting in. So that would be an example of a business model for getting access to data that you would not, not otherwise have. And then I guess the, the third business model that I see kind of popping up is companies which are very creatively merging what may be open data sets that others have access to, which may not be proprietary in and of themselves, but creatively bringing those together. And so, for example, there's a company called Urgenet. It's, it's, it's an Atlanta-based company, and they'll go to a, they'll, they will basically go to a company and they'll basically pull a whole bunch of data from their enterprise management system, and they'll pull weather data, you know, and, and they'll, they'll bring that together, and, and with that, they'll, they'll come up with a package which helps them reduce their energy consumption. So again, n nothing necessarily being that you wouldn't otherwise have access to, but just the creatively bringing it together. Um, and so the, uh, I guess the last thing I'll, I'll just chat about real quickly is, is policy issues, because as I, as I mentioned, at the end of the day, whoever owns the data is the one who is going to be able to realize the value from the data. So the data by itself isn't that useful, but if you don't have it, you have nothing to start with. And so lots of interesting policy discussions are going around the country. So a simple example would be NIPA, New York Power Authority. What they have done is, is they have basically said, we are going to make our data freely and openly available so that there can be open innovation. And, and then small businesses or large businesses can come and they can sell services to us to help us be more reliable or reduce our costs. And, and, and along the same lines where that's not happening, we're seeing the rise of consumer groups, which are trying to compel, in particular, um, public type companies to, uh, to make their, their, their data available in an in, 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 um, in easily accessible format. So just to summarize, the industrial data uh, segment, very interesting. What, we, what we're increasingly seeing is an emerging business around industrial data. We're seeing new ecosystems ari arise around it, so it's an interesting place to be, so I appreciate it. Great, thank you. Um, we'll save your questions and the pause for uh, the end of the event, but now I'd like to ask Barbara if she'd like to add anything to the... Uh... I, I would, and I'm, let me be brief here, because as we get into dialogue, what I'd like to do is share some of the the stories of, you know, as we bring all of this to life. Uh, but what I'd like to do is set a context. What's going on here? What's going on here? A lot of us recently have been thinking about 2007. Uh, and you can think about what happened in 2007 when Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone. What made that possible? It was the convergence of technologies. The, you know, the availability of an internet, the availability of certain um, nanotechnology that would give us the ability to you know, uh, simplify things and make them portable. That revolution and that acceleration of technology is what's setting the stage for the, the kind of phenomena that we're talking about here. But I want to share with you something uh, that, that comes from the pages of Siemens history. So in 2007, we were celebrating the 30-year anniversary of the first time we connected a power turbine uh, to remote uh, connections back to the office to be able to check on it, right? We didn't have the internet then. We had to wait a couple of decades before we could then uh, bring this capability truly to life. But as early as 1977, engineers and Siemens were trying to solve a problem. I know I can't be there all the time, and so how can I provide a remote connection and, and make, my, make my intellectual property available to this operator who has this asset? 
Now, fast forward then through these decades, you can see the many technologies that have come to play. And what we've been seeing in the communications world, in the computing world, is now available to us in the energy ecosystem. So think about, uh, I'll, I'll set the stage for the overall Siemens strategy, and it, it revolves around three levels, sort of a rubric, I think this is helpful. Electrification, automation, and digitalization. You'll hear us talk a lot about the fourth industrial revolution, or Industry 4.0. The first industrial revolution was the application of steam to make processes repeatable and make humans more productive. The second revolution brought in electrification. So now we didn't rely on the direct application of power from a steam turbine. Now we can, we can rearrange the footprint of our manufacturing environment. The third revolution came with automation. We can actually bring automated processes to life so that uh, more things get taken off of the human's responsibility and elevate the role of the human. Here we are in the fourth industrial revolution, and once again, we are elevating the role of the human. What Tim referred to in the game of Go against, uh, you know, computer against black belt. Turns out that when you pair a human with a computer, you defeat the computer. We're working to elevate the role of the human in the overall ecosystem here. What drives that? The data. Automation creates data. Data says what is or what was. And then we apply algorithms. What might be? And by doing that, we're able to then empower our customers, our, our supply chain, our employees, to actually accomplish things that have never been accomplished before. That's where we are right now. And we're on the very early stage of this discovery and this wave that's gonna hit the world. And what's it leading to? It's leading to things like distributed energy. The ability to turn this entire ecosystem we're in, the city of Washington, D.C., into a network where there are prosumers and consumers. We're able to tap into different energy sources. We're able to balance all of that, make it more reliable, more resilient. Siemens is working on those parts of the problem. We have know-how in the physical world. We're grounded in the laws of physics. We, we, we've created hardware, but we're, now we're also bringing the virtual world to bear, and this is providing a whole new layer of value to the ecosystem we're working in. And, and I love the concept of, of talking about open data because one of the things we're doing now is working with open systems. Siemens has introduced MindSphere. It's an operational technology platform that allows us to connect this internet of really big things so that we can share data, work together. And we've created um, not only digital centers where we're remotely working to control the assets that we're responsible for that will persist for decades in our infrastructure, but we're also opening up MindSphere application centers where we work collaboratively with others in this ecosystem uh, to create new applications. So I'm really looking forward to getting into this dialogue and, and thank you so much CSIS for, for hosting this. Uh, Jim, I think we're gonna have a fantastic conversation. What are the policies we need to be driving in order to make it possible for us to ensure that, that where we go actually benefits humanity? Thank you. Great, thank you. So one of the problems that a lot of us wrestle with is that uh, the U.S. has had flat productivity growth for a long time. There was a blip in the 90s, but probably the 70s was the last time we had really strong economic growth. And the only way we're going to get productivity growth, I will assert, is through automation. And as you've heard from both our speakers, this isn't going to be mechanical automation. It's going to be logical. And logical automation, meaning computers and digitalization, <laughs> produces data. And so we have this new, I don't know if resource is the, new, the right word. I never liked that data is the new oil. I mean, oil is the new oil. I suppose for an energy thing, well, I could say, but data is a resource and it gives you the ability 
to, uh, I liked something that uh, Tim said, um, aggregate, analyze, and monetize, right? Or something that Barbara said, uh, electrification, automation, digitalization. So we're on the cusp, and I think we're in very early days of this, on the cusp of hopefully seeing this productivity spurt, this growth in efficiency and in income um, around the world. But it does have implications for how we operate, and it does have implications for what companies will do. And we've all heard the disruptive technology thing. It's a, it's a bad word, but we've seen rapid change. I mean, if you live in Washington, you might remember at, uh, I think it was uh, 21st in Pennsylvania, there used to be a big building there that was Tower Records, right? Well, that industry's been uh, changed. This industry is going to change, so maybe we can talk about that. Um, what do you think the changes will be in the, in the energy industry that you will, will come out of this data-driven approach? Go ahead. Well, uh, first of all, everything is changing. Let's start there. Um, you know, we've got long-standing assets that we're going to need to care for over the long term. So I think you're right, Tim, that, that one of the big changes in this industry is going to be simply how things are maintained. And so I'll ask you a provocative question. If you could live anywhere you want to live, but still have access and be available to your customers, you know, wouldn't that be appealing to you? This idea of remote diagnostics, the ability to bring expertise anywhere in the world through the, you know, the, the network. Um, uh, we think that's, that, well, we know that is happening. That's happening at Siemens. Um, what about greater productivity of certain assets? You know, what we see is a race amongst various forms of power production mm -hmm. to who can be the most efficient. Well, it turns out there's a lot of efficiency to be gained all along the supply chain and value chain in not only our renewable energy, but also in fossil power. And we can use data to help us make all of that energy production more resilient, more environmentally friendly, et cetera. So, um, so we're seeing all of those changes happening within what I'll call our traditional, um, our traditional forms of, of addressing the energy market. So, you know, this comes kind of in two stages. One is let's automate and then use, use data in our traditional roles in our traditional jobs. But then the second phase is, wow, what about the things that we've never even dreamed of before? And what we're seeing now is um, new businesses emerging, uh, new players getting into markets, becoming an energy broker in the middle of, uh, say, neighborhoods with the use of blockchain in order to you know, uh, address supply and demand inside neighborhoods. Siemens is working in all of those areas. We're seeing that kind of dramatic change happening now. Hmm. We, by the way, we found out at CSIS if you can work blockchain into the title, report you. <laughs> more people coming. Yeah, you got about a twenty percent uptick. So, uh, thank yeah. you for saying that, <laughs> Tim. Well, I just say I'd say if you ask what's going to change, I guess there's a couple different sort of dimensions I would slice this on. I think one interesting question is if you flash forward twenty years, you know, what's a what's an energy company look like? What's mm -hmm. an industrial company look like? What's a utility look like? Um, you know, I think we've seen some fits and starts over the last couple years on company X, you know, being a digital industrial company. Um, you know, what, what do the suppliers look like? Just what does that overall ecosystem look like? I think it's very interesting to, to see where, where that's going because it's, it's not in, in, at all clear. And I think just sort of zooming down to my Georgia Tech centric point of view here, if I just look at the Georgia Tech ecosystem is sort of one of the biggest challenges we have is we kind of have our traditional subject matter experts in, in grid and chemical engineering and whatever, but we also have our blockchain and our AI and our computer scientists. And, and boy, they, they don't speak the same language. And, and it's, it's, it, in fact, the, the reward system, the cultures, they're very different. And so I think what I, that what's happening on a small scale there, I th we, we see more broadly, I think, happening in the corporate environment is as companies are sh grappling with, you know, what does it mean to, to sort of capture both sides of this? Because you've you got, you got to have the, the, the subject matter physical expertise, but you've got to have the computer science and in other expertise. And so, you know, just bringing together those two cultures is going to take time. I think the other piece I would say is there's a, there's a very significant kind of regional answer to your question because, you know, depending on kind of what the overall drive, you know, if, if you're, there, there's a, 
you know, China has, excuse me, India has, what, 300 million people without electricity. And so what, what innovation, what things are going to look like, look very different from Europe, um, where they're, you know, aggressively pr trying to reduce their carbon emissions. Um, and then I think also just to uh, Barbara's comment around blockchain, I think just more, more generally, this issue of, if I can throw out my favorite new word, dis, disintermediation. Right. Did I say that right? Disintermediation. Is that you know, just point? The, the, the whole idea of, of taking out that, that, you know, that, that you know, if we use the neighborhood example yeah. that you gave, that you don't have a utility that's arbitrating the relationship between the buyer and seller, but they're directly, well, that, that's just one example, but just the, the whole idea of, of, of changing out that, that network, I think, would be really interesting. Yeah. I, it, let me just um, yeah. come back to a point here about interdisciplinary, right? There's a lot of innovation that's going to happen as, as um, organizations start to recognize the value of bringing multiple capabilities together. Uh, and we see this happening in the university setting, right? Mm -hmm. you, you bring those computer sciences together with the mechanical engineers and just start asking the what if questions. And that's exactly what we're doing at our MindSphere application mm -hmm. centers. It just, you know, let's sit down, let's start with what data do we have? I mean, we've got cash in the attic, right? We, what data do we have? What could we do with it? And then, Start with a pilot. Start with a pilot, get a closed loop going so you say, hey, here's what I learned, let's get that information back, what else can we do with this? So there's a, there's a tremendous age of experimentation and discovery that's about to happen. Yeah, disintermediation is the secret of the internet. I don't know, when I was, it's not something we expected, but you've removed layers, things become more horizontal, we've heard that, there's new combinations. But in listening to both of you, um, we're gonna, move around a lot here on this. It strikes me that the, the part of this sector that will come under the most pressure will be the utilities, the people who deliver services now. Do you think that's right? And if it is right, or to the extent it's right, what does that say for our regulatory models, which are designed for, I don't know, either the 1950s or the 1930s? I can't make up my mind. But is the, is the pressure of this gonna fall first on the people who sell you power? What's it gonna look like? You want to start? Um, I'll, you, you go first. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, actually, so we participate in, in a lot of great dialogue about this. And, mm. and I love getting a room full of people who represent all the different stakeholders in this community. And what you find is everybody's worried. But utilities have an interesting challenge ahead of them because, you know, there's been this traditional model. It's existed for decades. It was highly regulated, and the rules are changing. Now they're asking their, themselves, what else can we do? Mm -hmm. the, the people in transmission and distribution are going, what the heck, who moved my cheese, right? If, if people are now gonna start to come off of my distribution network and they're generating themselves locally, who's gonna pay for all this infrastructure? Every single one of those stakeholders is now thinking about unique and, and innovative ways to use the assets they have. So these folks are coming along as partners in the discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say absolutely, and, and this goes back to my question about you know what is an, what does a utility company of the future look like? There is no right. doubt that they're going to look very different and have a have a different it, it, just just the, the, the types of, of skill sets they have, the types of partners, what their value, what their supply chain looks like. I think the other the other piece I would just say is I think there's a really interesting, almost philosophical discussion which is playing out across this country, and different different states and regions are taking different views. Is is just how do you best stimulate innovation in this sector? Because one could argue, you know, you, you have more market-based um, competitive type markets, and then you have the regulated markets. And I think, you know, both of them sort of, so, sort of have, a, have a different angle on this because you, you might suggest that, that, that at first glance, a competitive market might, might look like it'd be more fostering of, 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 of new ideas and innovation and disruption. But particularly if you start thinking about you know, what, what a utility does is that they basically you know, amortize risk over the lifetime of a very expensive you know, asset. And when we're talking about multi-trillion dollar um, electricity infrastructure, for example. Um, and this takes a long view, right? And in particular, generating some of this type of innovation, you know, it, it takes someone willing to, to, to take risks and take a long view. And if you're always worried about the spot price next week, um, that, that creates a real challenge. So I think, wh what is the role of regulation to stimulate innovation, I think, I think is a really interesting question that I don't know the answer to. Well, yeah, and one of the things, as Siemens, one of the things we are vocalizing to our, you know, the policymakers we deal with is, one of the things that really matters to businesses in this space is enough regulatory stability 
which of course is in direct conflict to the pace of change that we have going on, but you're absolutely right. We're talking about infrastructure that's going to persist for decades to come. And anyone who's gonna be making decisions about how to invest in that has to know that, that their investment is gonna be, uh, in some sense, protected. So I, I, I do think we're gonna see the push and pull of this as we go. So where are the opportunities then for the industry in this? What are the things, we were talking about innovation and innovation is about opportunity to some extent. What do you see the opportunities being? Where should companies invest? What are the technologies we need? You know, where do you wanna see innovation in this? Well, I'd, I'd say there's lots of opportunity for, for in, so, so within the current kind of framework, let's just start there. Yep. And then we can talk about more disruptive ideas. But within the current framework, there's lots of opportunities. And what this whole data digitalization and automation um, revolution is doing, even within current technology bases, it's increasing the efficiencies of these devices. And this is, this is a trillion dollars market you know, over, over 20 years. Uh, so there's a lot of money there because the, because the value of the infrastructure out there's just so much value you know if you think about the u.s as these two big economies we have a hydrocarbon economy oil and gas we have an electricity economy both of them multi-trillion dollar economies and so the, so so better optimizing the efficiencies of these things there's significant opportunities um, and then obviously from the resilience point of view and then obviously from a sort of looking out at, at, at to what's possible that's where things really get interesting um, and uh, I guess one of the things I'd also like to just to point out, just kind of like as there, there's, there's a tension between sort of uh, decentralization of, of, of these sectors, and, and, but there's also, a, there's also a corresponding pull towards concentration. Again, I don't, I don't know, we were chatting about this, about this um, when we were upstairs, but I think you know, we're increasingly seeing, let's just say in the, developing, in the developed world, we're seeing a lot of drive towards decentralization. We talked about blockchain as an enabler and disintermediation as, as an enabler for that. But then increasingly, see, we see at least up till last year, if you look at the big industrials, that their new types of technologies are getting, getting larger and bigger. And, and, and the reason for that is efficiency. You know, there's, by going bigger, you get higher efficiencies and you drive down fuel costs per, per kilowatt that way. So. Mm -hmm. It, where, do, where do we want to see then this kind of opportunity play out? Um, I'm with you. I think um, the efficiency is going to be clearly an objective of ours. Uh, what we're trying to do is empower the world, right? Uh, it, we've got to bring electricity to more of the world. And, and whether that requires big power, which is the right answer in many cases, mainframe computing, right, is still useful in certain applications or whether that's distributed energy, you know, both, there's a place for both. And, and the kinds of things we're talking about will enable both. Um, but, but I also think that, that we've got to think differently about getting power to the rest of the world. We talk about India without access. You know, we talk about something like, uh, you know, you hear varying uh, statistics, 30% uh, you know, of the world's population, 70% of the world's land mass, you know, doesn't mm -hmm. have access to electricity. It, that is going to be the big game changer that actually enables um, economies to shift, cultures to shift, you know, as, as more people engage. One of the things we're really concerned about is the winner-take-all kind of world we're living in today. And data becomes the coin of the realm. I've heard people talk yeah. about data as the utility. I'm not sure it's the utility. I, I actually think it is the coin. And, and so this concept that um, we've got to really work hard as we invent this future, you know, are we going to be the, uh, the Rockefellers and the Carnegies who were the, you know, early adopters who, you know, who amassed wealth, you know, in this major shift, or are we going to be involved in enabling others to be able to tap into this and, in essence, bring themselves along? Siemens has chosen the latter. We're, we're absolutely committed, We've, and I'll just take a moment and just share with everyone, uh, think about a framework of business to society, a, a company that doesn't bring value to society shouldn't exist. So, so what we're working on in this framework is, is you know, how do we use this coin of the realm and show others how to find it within their own systems so that they can unlock the potential uh, within their own value chains. Yeah, if I can, I, let me just add to that. I totally would echo this idea of a really interesting thing I looked at. I was looking at types of energy and in, in innovation companies that VCs were investing in in the United States. And then I did a, a similar uh, profile for India. 
And it was really interesting to see what innovation looks like in these two regions. And I think in particular, you know, in the US, it's, it, or at least it was, maybe not today, but it was biofuels and now it's analytics and, um, you know, whiz-bang battery type storage. In India, I would say many of the technologies were really around getting, getting um, insight and data to every person, you know, letting, empowering them so that they could sort of optimize within their own sphere of influence. And that was really interesting to, to, to look at that because, again, what does innovation look like is in profoundly regional. Who can innovate? Turns yeah. out talent is pretty well evenly dispersed yeah. throughout humanity, yeah. right? Yeah. So let's, let's tap into more of that. I, I want to take uh, a little bit of uh, difference with a, a comment that you made earlier um, about that privacy is not an issue with this industrial data. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, think about this from the, the side of confidentiality. What I just now said about, uh, you know, who owns the data really, you know, has the coin of the realm. Um, I, I'll tell, share with you an experience we're having with many of our customers is this idea that, whoa, 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 whoa. this operational data, this, pro this production data that, that you all are collecting and helping me use, it, this is my secret sauce. No, this can't be shared with others. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the things we're working on right now is uh, the idea of doing more computing, I'll just say, at the edge. Uh, you know, these great terms mm. that we can mm -hmm. adopt from our information technology world. But, but more computing at the edge, you know, data held locally at the site of use so that our customers can be, um, so they can be confident that that data is not available to their competitors. Hmm. Interesting. It's something I loved about the Georgia Tech paper is recognizing that geography is going to make an impact on how we use data because the infrastructure available to access data, you know, is, is going to be sparse in some areas. Well, so both for infrastructure reasons and then control of the coin reasons, we're, we're dealing with this uh, requirement to do more computing locally rather than porting data back to the cloud. And then I, all I want to do is just share with everyone, I'm a big believer that when we do port the data back to the cloud and begin to use that data, the best knowledge we can get from multiple sources, what Siemens is working on is protection of that data, anonymity of that data, so no one sees anyone else's secret sauce, but we all learn from the aggregation of the data. It's gonna be a huge driver in innovation. Yeah. It, this might be a, apocryphal, but uh, I was thinking the same thing about there's no privacy implications because I was told that uh, you know jet engines now call in flight to the maintenance centers and that the under the new European privacy rules, if the, the name of the mechanic or the name of the engineer at the maintenance center is in the data, the engine is, sending, if there's any PII, it triggers a privacy ruling, so the jet engine has to comply with GDPR. So, so, so fair, fair point. I guess it comes down to <laughs> one definition of privacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. I was talking about the, yeah, there's certainly no, I got it. Cust uh, owner type issues, but. Well, we want to come back to, I think, yeah. the issue of uh, who owns the data, but the coin of the realm comment is interesting, so maybe between the two of you can give us a couple examples of where is data the coin of the realm? Tell us how it works. What are some specific examples of that? I, like I could do that for, I like, I like for nest example. I could do that for social media, but I'm not sure I could do it for the. Huh. Well, I'll, I'll just uh, so I'll just give an example. Something I'm very personally familiar with. My own expertise is, is in gas turbines, and so sort of having a lot of subject matter expertise in gas turbines. If I can get access to the data from a site, I can very quickly hmm. um, give them a lot of really interesting insights. For example, the, the efficiency point of view. You know, I, I, from some of the, the work that we've done, you know, we can we can in many cases, you know, give them two percentage points of efficiency, which which, which is a significant bump in, in profitability that I mentioned before, um, and also from the the, the system reliability and, and um, uh, point of view, just having that domain expertise without the, without the data. I'm just sitting in the corner. You know, I can have a room full of the smartest computer scientists and data, data analytics people, but without the data, they're just they're just plunking away at their computer, just doing doing nothing. And 
If, but when you get access to the data, which has the spice to it, the real world, because the real world is just so many dimensions that you can never really model, that's where, that's where you can really start realizing the, 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 the value streams that I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me give you an example of a wind farm, right? So I've got a wind farm that's got turbines running, and uh, you know they, they each today could operate independently. We, what we've discovered is you take the data from each of those turbines, you teach the turbines themselves to optimize their own performance, anticipate the weather, you know, anticipate the, you know, the changing seasons and da 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 and put all that together and, and the wind turbine itself becomes more efficient, more proficient. Um, now, teach that wind turbine to talk to other wind turbines in that wind farm and now we're talking about, you know, think about a, a hundred stick wind farm producing, you know, thousands of megawatts of power and we're talking about increases that are phenomenal that's power that somebody isn't going to have to pay for, right? Mm -hmm. That's cash in the attic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'll just let me just throw one other, one other example <coughs> beyond the ones Those I mentioned. Good I examples. just. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I, w I would just say, you know, in competitive markets where you're you're, you're doing, let's just say, day ahead or week ahead type bidding, mm -hmm. and you're trying to trying to, um, in particular, if you're committing yourself to being able to generate a certain amount of power, you're trying to ride the ragged edge between if you can't commit, if you can't <coughs> produce enough power you've committed to, you're buying power on the spot market and you can obliterate your Bingo. profits very quickly. Bingo. On the other hand, if you can really Get, you know, when you can catch it when the spot price is really spiked, you can make a lot of money in a big hurry. And so that's where what you got to do is, so, so in that case is you're talking about riding on fractions even of a percentage of the output of that plant. So you got to know, you got to have a great model of that thing supplemented by um, sort of the data from the, from the facility so that you calibrate it, maybe a good weather prediction, uh, because in many cases thermal plants, the performance is a function of weather. This is all flowing into something and then out of that you, you flip a coin, I guess, to, to, to figure out how much, how much you're willing to, to, to bet. Yeah, now, and then come back to the insurance example, right? Because, you know, many of us are dealing with insurance companies because of the unpredictability. What if it was actually predictable? I recently participated in a, we were talking about, uh, about our new uh, vehicles and our, our new <laughs> systems of driving around the city, and I was speaking to the risk manager of Lyft at an insurance conference, believe it or not. And, uh, and, and think about how insurance has worked traditionally. Take 20 years worth of actuarial data and make decisions about you know, what is the likelihood of certain things happening. We're in an accelerating era of change and, and what it turns out is you need to be able to use data instantaneously. What we're trying to do is talk to the insurance industry to say, digitalize, come with us on this journey we're going to bring down the risk level for the insurance companies as well as for us. So the flip side of data is modeling. Um, where's the places we should look? Where should we be look? Are we keeping up on the modeling side? You can have lots of data. You want to predict. Mm -hmm. You want to find areas of growth. You have to have a good model. Where's the, ac where's the action in modeling for this? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a great topic. Yeah, that, that you want to take a I love, so let me start okay. because this is another one that'll go lots of different directions. And, and I used to do models without data, so I understand this really well. <laughs> and, and this is why Siemens is so excited about this and why your paper concludes that manufacturers today are actually in a leading position on this because that knowledge hmm. of the physical world is necessary for the creation of the virtual models. Um, at, at modeling, we're doing sort of three things. Think about the model of the production facility, a digital twin of the production facility oh. itself. What about a digital twin of the product to be manufactured? Ooh, even better, what about a digital twin of the product while it's in use? And the digital thread that runs throughout, that goes from the idea all the way to the end. There aren't enough engineers coming out of schools today with the know-how to do this. And so what we're working on at Siemens is ways to, A, just make this more intuitive for people. Siemens product lifecycle management is a tool suite that is enabling digitalization for manufacturing. And, and it's being used by many, many other players beyond manufacturing because of that, that ease of being able to get non-engineers to play in the engineering game so that we can get our modeling right. I'll start there. How's that? Yeah, I would just say that, that I mean, what, the question you're asking is part of a broader discussion in the AI community. There's been a couple special issues in The Economist on this exact topic is 
what, what is the role of domain expertise? I guess models would be one example mm -hmm. of domain expertise. It could be a mathematical model. It could be basic rules. Um, what is the role of domain expertise in this world we're entering? And is the next, are, are we going to need engineers in 20 years, or is it going to be, every, is, will it be computer scientists? You know, that would be one extreme of, of, a, of, a, of a position. Um, and I think if you look at the, the, the types of firms that, that, are, that are coming out there, there's kind of this spectrum of, of sort of, sort of pure data driven, you know, really, really strong on the analytics side versus very strong domain expertise. And the kinds of firms you're seeing are all, are sort of um, across the map. So obviously there's the big industrial firms which have historically been way on the right, which are moving to the left. You have, you have traditional IT firms traditionally way on the left trying to move to the right. And then again, if you t look at the kinds of firms that, that small companies, that VCs, you know, you just look at the, the, the companies that are emerging, you'll see them all across the, 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 the spectrum where you see companies that have a, sort of a data analytics sort of background and they have a big, they have a really nice hammer and they're looking for nails to hit, right? And then you have, then you also see people which, which have really strong domain expertise, you know, trying to rapidly to, to learn what supervised versus unsupervised learning is in, in, in AI. And so, I, again, I, I don't know where the answer is going to be, but it's a really, again, it goes back to the point we were making around there's this emerging industry, really fascinating ecosystem, and you see all of these, these, these firms. And it's, it's not obvious to me where, where it's going to sit and where the, the, uh, the um, consolidation is going to happen. A, a but being an engineer, the answer is farther to the right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a particular yeah. problem with this industrial data we're talking about is that you don't necessarily have the kind of population size that you have, say, yeah. in you know the social yeah. things. That's right. And and so you know fewer gas turbines than there are people on Twitter, you know, for example. Um, and so one of the, the, another thing that we have our engineers working on is how do you do more with less data? You know, what what kind of modeling and algorithms? What kind of machine Machine learning uh, can actually be done in a sparse data world. Yeah. All this makes me wish I'd paid more attention when I took statistics. Yeah. But uh, I still have a lot of questions, um, but let's give you a chance. Are there questions in the audience? And could I ask, if you have a question, could you just please identify yourself? If not, we're going back to me talking. Uh, go ahead up in the front. Oh, we have multiple questions. So first, second. I'll go, go back to well, you'll Wait for the, the microphone, microphone. yeah. I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of Emerald Planet, Emerald Planet TV, and thank you for being here. Very interesting discussion. Good for you in Georgia Tech, so I'm a VT guy. Anyway, uh, going back to the city, you made a very profound statement about just looking at Washington, D.C. as an ecocenter within itself. And we're looking at power and the production of power and how that's going to translate out to the community. So how do we look at all the uh, energy that's being created in a very small footprint of a Washington, D.C., just the heat rising from the pavement, the water falling from all, you know, these high-rise buildings, low-flow hydro. You know, we got a lot of energy sources here that's actually going untapped and not being used. But I think in what you're talking about through the uh, Georgia Tech study and all that is we have to look at every source I was just in India for a month, and you say 300 million, it's about 500 million without power, because you go to these towns, there is no power. Grid's going over top, nothing in the, in the community. So, but how do we translate these, these centers, like a DC or a New York or a Chicago or LA, mm -hmm. and translate that into new power sources that's actually going into the grid, not just coming out of the grid, because it's always been this delivery now you've got a two-way flow. We've got the two-way flow. And thank yeah. you for being here. Yeah, I, thank you, my pleasure. And I'm so glad you asked this question because you know, you're right. When you, if you go into the energy market, it, you know, maybe 10 years ago, you wouldn't have talked to people about building energy. Um, I, when you were talking about hot air, I, and we're in Washington, I was thinking you might even turn to that political hot air. But I mean, if we could tap into that, imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Leave that one alone. Uh, the, so this idea that uh, you know everything around us, these buildings, uh, frankly, our transportation systems themselves are battery. They're battery. They are energy storage and energy production potential uh, opportunities for us. Um, there's, I think there's research going on in every aspect of that right now. Greater water efficiency, um, combined heat and power, 
right? Uh, innovations in how buildings are constructed. And, and so one of the things we've done is we've actually put together a cities team. And they have what they call a city performance tool. So if there's a mayor and city council who want to achieve certain goals, whether it's you know more power to my people, I want to I want to become the new hub for bioengineering, and it's going to have an energy demand. Siemens, help me figure out how I can get there. And what we're able to do is is have these uh, collaborative conversations. Let's let's tune a bunch of knobs and decide what do we need. So uh, the example I like to share is the city of LA recently went through this kind of analysis, and what they discovered was that to hit their sustainability goals, they were going to need to convert all transportation in the city to electric. In order to do that, they would increase the amount of electricity they need to move by 1,500%. Wow, that's a challenge, right? We're going to need new infrastructure. We're going to need new sources of renewable energy, et cetera. That kind of analysis is going on, and I'm confident that we're seeing innovations in every aspect of the network. We've got the equivalent of the iPhones, the desktops, the laptops, all coming together into our internet of energy. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add to that. You know, one of the, we didn't talk about storage today, but I think you may, I'll just yeah. tee that one up because mm -hmm. that's a really interesting disruptor. It's a really interesting point as we think about this internet of energy and you know, just big suppliers of, of, of energy, lots of, of, of um, smaller distributed. You have prosumers buying and selling electricity at the same time. But I think what's, what's I have to remind myself is what's really interesting and distinctive about electricity in particular is the fact that we consume it at essentially the same instant of time that we produce it. And so if somebody flicks the light off back there, there is a power plant, probably a thermal power plant somewhere nearby that makes an infinitesimal decrease in energy in a very short time. I mean, you just, just think about the implication that has on what companies look like, what supply chains look like. If t take a sector you're all, another sector like wheat, you know, the bread you eat. Think about if that was a just-in-time market. Let's just say a day, you know, wheat lasted a day. You know, just think about how that whole ecosystem fundamentally changed is different from Wheat lasts a day, oh, you can store it, you know, you can grow it in the, in the summer. And, and to think about what that's going to do um, as, that, as, as, as storage gets more deployed into the electricity sector where you could potentially think about storing it. And I think oftentimes when we talk about storage, people's mind immediately jump to batteries, big battery packs, you know. Um, but, but storage is not, is, obviously there's, there's time scales, right? You can talk about storing electricity for a few seconds or a few minutes or even days, and you know, then, you, then you start looking at a whole, or, or, or months potentially, as you start talking about moving between seasons, and so then you start thinking not only about batteries, but potentially generating liquid renewable fuels that you could potentially store, and then you could draw on them, but it's really interesting how this whole issue around data and digitalization and, um, and, and blockchain, what that's gonna look when you, when you fundamentally, if, if and when that is fundamentally disrupted with, with large-scale storage. So um, this will be an ongoing story because, you know, what we're seeing is cheap sensors, uh, good storage in a data sense, yeah. cheap storage, uh, cheap computing power. So we're going to be instrumenting cities, and the first places will be energy and transportation. So there's going to be a whole new wave of data on how cities operate that will you will need to figure out how to use it. But uh, you know what it looks like to live in a city will be different 10 years from now than what it looks like now. It's still basically a 1930s city out there, you know, with a stoplight. And, you know, there's a few applications, like Waze. Waze depends on human collectors. That's terrible, right? So Waze says, don't go this way, there's a traffic jam. Well, some guy had to input that. That's ridiculous. So when we get to the point where your AI mobile device will be collecting from city centers to tell you energy traffic, it'll be a very different world. And we never got to talk about data localization and ownership, which I will try to come back to, but we did have two more questions. Uh, we had one in the front here, and then one in the back. What is happening in taking account mathematical expectation of probability of various outcomes times their value to make the decisions in this? Tell us who you are. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant in energy. Well, I mean, so, so I get the, the, the intrinsic with all this stuff is, is there's a, 
a probability. Well, let's just talk about bidding. Mm -hmm. the, the example I gave ahead of, about bidding ahead in, in day ahead or a, a week ahead market, you're, you're always wrapping a probability and there's a risk calculation around that. You know, you have a 90% probability of making so many dollars and a 5% probability of losing your shirt. And you know, that, 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 that stuff goes into, there's very sophisticated tools which are routinely used that wrap those around and at the end of the day, it's a risk calculation. Same calculations that our users are, are uh, using as they decide, am I going to go down this road, right? So imagine that you're, a, um, you're in the natural gas field and you're trying to decide whether to use digitalization to increase your production. Well, there's an investment in some infrastructure that's needed for the IT systems that will support that, et cetera. A lot of folks today are actually waiting they're making the decision that, ah, I, I don't see that this investment is worth the outcome. All I can say to all of those people is get started. Get started now or else somebody else is stealing your lunch money. And ultimately, well, to some extent, this will go back to the market and to prices. And you can tell what school I went to, but markets and prices are a good way to say, what is, what is the market? The market is actually millions of individuals and they're taking bets. And that's ref their bets are reflected in prices. So you could say there's market failure in this. I, maybe we can talk about that. I don't think there is, but you know, people are gonna look and say, here's a chance to make money. There's some risk, but I'm gonna do it. I hope that the people take your advice and move out, take the risk and, and uh, see what they get. But the prices, I would say, the prices are pointing in the direction you guys have been talking about. The gains here in returns to the firm, returns to the individual, that's what's gonna drive people. And so you, prices, markets are a way to predict, right? They're not always good, but they actually work pretty well. Anyhow, enough of a University of Chicago sermon. Uh, in the <laughs> Hi, my name is Bill Holland. I'm a reporter for S&P Global Market Intelligence. This question may just show how stupid I am. Um, I'm having trouble disconnecting, connecting uh, what data, how data databases have to do with electrification of, let's say, rural and isolated areas, which strikes me as an engineering problem, not a data problem. Could you solve that for me? Boy, that's a red meat one. We'll turn it over to these guys. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to play? I, I, I always come at the end, right? So. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Well, I, I would just say, so, the, so digitalization is the emerging, well, if, if we just take electric, obviously the, I'd say this discussion is not just electricity, but industrial. Um, industrial. Let, let, let's just take, let's put it down to a case, okay? We have an isolated island in the Philippines, a nation yep. of 7,000 yep. islands. We're gonna put, we wanna get power to that island. Right now it's powered by a power barge, which is a fossil fuel barge that just generates electricity and sends it ashore we want to change that power system to solar Philippines would say solar. Um, how, do we, how do we electrify the island next door which has no power bar, barge and no solar? And how does data fit into that equation? That's the, the connection I'm trying to make. Well, I mean, I think certainly there's, there's a technology piece to, um, to, to you know, and there's, there, there are existing technologies which Siemens great, makes great, has a, has a whole um, field of solutions to, 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 to electrify that island. I think what we're, what we're particularly focusing on here is just this, uh, this emerging ecosystem around the data that comes from assets like that. Um, and uh, the, the benefit that that, can ha that, that digitalization and analysis of the data from, let's just say, this, this new island will have, but also by aggregating, analyzing and monetizing that data across a range of other islands, how you, can, how you can mutually benefit and help each other better operate your grids for lower cost and more reliability. What if there's no grid? What if in the future, electricity could be transmitted wirelessly? What if uh, we can find forms of power generation or power storage uh, that are far more efficient than they are today and we can bring down the cost of those elements? Data is being used at all, in all aspects of the innovation cycle to make those kinds of things possible. I mean, the first thing is you gotta have the notion. You know, here's where I say it's good old human bootstrapping. Right? You gotta have the notion, I, here's something I wanna go accomplish. Now we're gonna use the data. 
is there a market there? Is there a need? Is, is it cost effective to address that market? Is cost the, the main factor? Or is this something that's worth an investment? Boom, you know, so, so on and so forth. We're using the data. For the first time in history, the data is available to us. For the first time in history, these elements within our physical world are producing information that help us understand, would this be effective or not? Now, I'm doing this today with the United States Navy. They hired Siemens to say, hey, go fence to fence at Naval Station Guantanamo Bay and give us an energy makeover. And we've been able to use data to help inform first, what's the art of the possible? How can we get you off those diesel generators? Oh, turns out we can bring LNG to Guantanamo Bay. Combine that with wind, combine that with solar, combine that with the building envelope changes that are gonna make your buildings more efficient. Now we have a total solution that's less expensive than the American taxpayer is paying for today in the utility bill for Naval Station Guantanamo Bay. We can finance that job. It'll be done in a couple of years. And the Navy will be able to experience those savings for decades to come. That's how we're using data in new and different ways. Yeah, if, I, if I can just add one more thing to it. I think it also, I'm just, I, I wanna, obviously there's your, your Philippine Island, but I think you, you have to be thinking about the overall ecosystem that, that is, that is in, in supply chain that, that's installing that. And I think it's really important to recognize that in these types of industries, increasingly the business models are not on selling the asset itself, but on the services side. Mm -hmm. and, um, and as soon as you start moving to that model, the data is the coin of the realm, because the data is the critical piece towards towards realization of those services. Yeah. You know, or just, or just take the, uh, the photovoltaic market, for example. Um, these are essentially commodities right now, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's been a race to the bottom. It's hard to make money selling PV. And so what you're trying to do is figure out how do you use data so that you can develop better services to, to sell that power into the market or, or, or generate it for yourself. Mm -hmm. one, one of the reasons I, I don't worry about artificial intelligence is that you have transaction costs that get in the way of people on this island figuring out what the solution is to their electricity problem. And they have a portfolio of options now that they didn't have before. And they will have, soon we hope, the ability to discover those options and then figure out how they want to do it. And some of this is development. Does the government invest? Does someone else invest? Does someone in the market invest? But it's just going to become easier to do things when we have devices and data that will help us make decisions. And your point earlier about, um, I forget, it was some IBM machine, you know, whatever it was, Deep Purple, uh, beats the Go Master, but a human and a machine beat Deep Purple. And that's the direction we're moving in, is it's going to be easier for people to do things. So I'm hoping for an explosion yeah. in technological change and in productivity not just in the US, but in other places. And then you get into this question of, do you have the political and social structures to take advantage of it? India does, China does, Philippines maybe, but we're, you know, get ready for the, the tidal wave is coming, is what I would say. Uh, two things, any more questions? Oh gosh, I shouldn't have said that, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Matt Skelton, I'm an industrial modeler for EIA. Uh, my question, is that the third type of data you talked about emerges from physical assets. That's what I'm interested in, in the, in the physical modeling that I do. Um, how is you know, this digital, digital, digitalization going to um, affect heavy industry? You know, I mean, bulk mm -hmm. chemicals, iron and steel, cement. Uh, I mean, these are, you know, like you said, physics-based processes. How is this information going to increase efficiency or you know, uh, produce more with less? Uh, let me start. Um, so Siemens, actually, I, we do have experience in all of those industries. And, and this is the voyage of discovery we're on. So you know, everything from first modeling how should we set up the manufacturing line, what changes should we make, what kind of throughput are we experiencing, et cetera, to, um, to what can we do to aid the human in the loop Right, all of those things are getting the benefit of this digitalization. Uh, you know, we've seen this, um, 
there are certain things that are going to require the physical interaction. I think my favorite example comes from healthcare. Right? You can use all kinds of technology to help you with diagnosis and maybe treatment, but only the doctor can provide care. We've got that same thing in our industrial processes. And at Siemens industry, we, we're producing the sensors that go into the, the control systems that actually support these heavy industries. And, and the, the factory itself is one of the most automated factories that we have in our network. And yet, it employs more people than ever before. So, you know, we're, we're getting into a new age where every single one of these areas, I, I was recently in South America for the World Economic Forum on Latin America, and there was a question about the use of Industry 4.0 in, in minerals and mining. And a Siemens customer was in the audience and stood up and talked about the application of data, increasing his company's profit by an additional 10%. Spurring on, spurring on the innovation to uh, to design, you know, I mean, to, to spur on the engineers to design new products to more effectively capture energy and, and things like that. I this think is, that's exactly how it works, yeah. right? The the thing that the sensors do is they let you know more about your physical assets, and how that's how we learn, isn't it? Ooh, I, you know, if if I step in that hole, I'm going to get hurt, right? It, the what we're getting is the 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 feedback from the process itself that's telling us what's working or what isn't, or from the operating item as we, once it's in the field, what's working, what's about to break. It's feedback to the engineers to use their imagination then to, to go on to the next level. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add something to that, because I think before we talk about data, I think we have to back up almost a decade and say, decline. what's the enabler? Why are we here today? It's because there's a declining cost in sensors, cost of communications, declining cost in communications, declining cost in storage, declining cost in computer power, right? So, a lot of this stuff that we're talking about, it could have been done 50 years ago, except it just wasn't, wasn't cost competitive because of computing costs, communication Great capabilities, point. sensors. Now that we have this, it's, you could say the dog has caught the bus, right? So now what do we do with the bus now that we caught it? So that's where this new ecosystems are arriving around. Wow, we have all this data. We can really start doing some cool stuff. So you can think of this as sort of data 1.0 as using the existing data within the existing sort of technologies to make them operate better. But to your question is, what's going to happen next is, because of this more ubiquitous sensing, that is actually going to change designs and mode of operation. There's actually a very similar discussion going on today around additive manufacturing. We're kind of, implementation 1.0 is make existing stuff better, but as you can start making, as you get you know complexity for free or, or for lower cost, you actually start thinking about design for additive. You actually start changing the design in the same way. If we can actually have, measurements in this location, data from this point, I would actually design the system a little bit differently or potentially a lot differently so it operates better. And that's what we're seeing happen. We had, uh, I think, two final questions. Why don't we aggregate them and then we can more or less get on time. Could those people hold up their hands if you're still, uh, okay, one here. We'll do them one, two, and then uh, get some answers. Uh, my name's Nick Katsiotis. I'm part of the Roscom Group, the largest builder of Siemens power plants in the world right now. Uh, I've got a question about cybersecurity. How are we, for example, Siemens is moving all over between Germany here. How are we protecting things our government's really investing in to create? And then at Georgia Tech, you've got a lot of grant money. Uh, you know, I guess a lot of these guys aren't protecting data. I don't know this. But how are we standardizing this to protect the investment we're making, you know, in these different technologies. Did, did you are we going to aggregate? aggregate? Oh, aggregate. sure. Analyze. I forgot. I was so he said cybersecurity. Yeah, right. we're, we're trying to listen. <laughs> he started thinking, he's starting thinking about encryption. So <laughs> Zach Valdez, I'm a uh, science and technology policy fellow with the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Um, I have a question on the same sort of front in terms of when we move out to the edge and we're looking at distributed energy and how uh, blockchain can help person-to-person uh, -person transactions occur, what are we looking at in terms of vulnerability assessments with all this data being shared um, kind of on this open network? Good. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Go ahead. Great aggregate questions. Yeah, let me start. Um, so first of all, it, Siemens today employs well over a thousand cybersecurity experts. This is this is the core issue, right? You, these are table stakes. You get you get nothing else in the business without first being able to assure your customers and suppliers, partners, that that you have the best cybersecurity you can offer today. 
now. Where are the threats coming for? That's always changing. So this is a constant fight. But, but our, what we're doing is from you know, the, the point of inception all the way through the chain, assuring cybersecurity to the best of our ability all along that chain. And what we've done is we've partnered in industry, creating a charter of trust, uh, really identifying commitments we think the industry needs to make together and having co-signatories in the charter of trust and guiding how we as an industry ought to operate recognizes that we can't do this alone. Do you, you want to go? I mean, this is your area. No. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's, but he's going to give us a grade. Oh, okay. So All right. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, obviously, this is like, it's, it's, it is the issue, right, with, with what we're talking about. I mean, because it, it uh, and, and so I would just generally say that, that uh, standardization is, is a really interesting question. You know, it's it, the number one issue around getting data around out of power plants and it's in every power plant is different. I'm sure Siemens has this story where every power plant is different and some of them they have to they have to just keep it all there. They just simply will not let them let it out the door whereas others um, but but uh, you know the, the uh, so so that is that that is a it's a major issue around standardization um, and you know just recently I think was it FERC just gave out a very very large fine to it to a utility ar around this issue uh, and so you know Georgia Tech this has been the, the biggest growth area in our own R and D you know we have a, I think 850 million dollar a year R and D portfolio the fastest growing area has been cybersecurity you know across the whole across lots of different applications, but, but electricity and oil and gas have been, been growth areas. One of the things that we've done a lot on, we, we have a couple products around just, just a threat sharing, you know, basically anonymized threat sharing. Um, so you know whether you're getting, getting hit with a commodity hack or whether you're getting hit with a targeted hack. So even, even that is some, some really valuable, just creating these, these anonymized communities. Mm -hmm. But then this is why we got involved in blockchain, because we feel that's one of the technologies that's going to enable the decentralization of energy. So I was in uh, New York uh, a couple months ago talking to a bunch of banks, and they said they hadn't yet seen any, uh, this is the financial sector, any scalable blockchain models. Mm. I'm, are you seeing something different? I mean, what we're finding is that we've got good applications for the kinds huh. of things we're working on, right? We're not establishing a global brokerage for power. We're talking about you know, small scale, think about your nanogrid, your microgrid, mm -hmm. uh, you know, within that, this is a powerful tool for us. Anything more? No. Well, I, and I'm gonna dodge the cybersecurity question by saying that uh, when Karen Evans, who's the head of the new DOE cyber office gets settled in, she's an old friend and we'll force her to come here and answer She'll your be questions great. better. She'll <laughs> be great, yeah. Better than I can do, certainly. Um, with that, please join me in thanking our two speakers. Thank you. Yeah, enjoyed it. Yeah, that was fun. That was fun. Yeah, Thank you.